So I, I've had people comment that the interior of this thing's a bit like an an, travelling antiques roadshow. They used to carry so much air ministry equipment for their, you know, role of anti-submarine, anti-boat uh, patrol. That um, yeah, they, it was a, a phase of the war where a lot of new developments were coming along. You know, they were having radio, although you couldn't talk on these radios. It was all Morse code. It was it was new new technology. What they didn't have in those days was emergency locator transmitters like we have today. Their emergency locator transmitter was carried in this little cage here. You can see the carrier pigeon. Each bomber carried two carrier pigeons. And the idea was that when you're floating in your life raft in the North Sea or English Channel, you'd take your pigeon out, tie a message to its ankle and send it off home asking for help. Some 20 odd pigeons were actually awarded medals for saving lives. Other equipment in this area of the um, cabin, we've got the sea markers. Um, it's aluminium powder, brightly coloured aluminium powder, which they'd throw out. The container was just made of cardboard. It would, it would dissolve in the seawater and then leave a big mark on the sea surface. So you might have seen a downed airman or you want to mark a, where a submarine periscope had been so that you could come back over the spot and find it easily. The, the coloured water would obviously help you get back over the right spot. Also there's flame floats here, which again, they were for navigation to, to work out your drift. You'd throw the flame float out, get some smoke going on the surface, circle back around, fly over it, and with your tail drift sight, you could work out how much wind or and what direction it was coming from. The um, observation compasses, if you saw some enemy activity, you know, a U-boat or E-boats, you'd need to report back their bearing. Um, and to help with that, you have these observa big observation compasses. And because the aircraft's basically a st steel tube structure, um, you needed to get the compass away from the steelwork so that it would work properly. So you've got a compass either side here, and they slide over the carriers, and then you slide them out the door. This is the cradle here. They, uh, lean out and, and get, your, get your sighting and, and work out their bearing. and exactly where they were so you could report report that back on your Morse code cue here. On the rear bulkhead here we have the oldest signal lamp because the aircraft was working a lot with the Royal Navy and, and merchant ships the only way they could communicate with them obviously was by Morse code on the signal lamp so they carried that and it plugs in just over here on the on the shelf. Here are the starting handles for the engines. The, um, the early Cheetah 9s didn't have electric starters, they had to be hand cranked, so they'd carry a couple of handles to, um, for the ground crew to crank them up, and of course they needed them if they were travelling to an away base, they'd need to carry the, the handles with them, so they clip them back onto the door here. And the crash axe, and under here is the gunner's parachute. Um, the gun turret was just too small to be able to wear your parachute in there. You could just see you sit on this little bicycle seat here, and uh, the gun's sort of right in your face, so um, there wasn't much, wasn't much room. So in an emergency, he would have to somehow get out of the turret, clip that parachute onto his harness, and then jettison the rear door here and uh, jump out. Hopefully, I had enough height to do that. I'm told that within Coastal Command, because they rarely flew over 3,000 feet, that towards the end of all they just stopped even carrying parachutes. They figured that it was better to stick with the aircraft rather than try and bail out. Um, again, I don't know whether you can see here is the sextant. They carried a bubble sextant for taking sun shots or star shots. And you, you take the sextant out and stick the hatch, Astro hatch up in the next compartment, opens inwards and you could stand up there on the spar and take some shots. Would have been pretty windy, I think. There's another compass here and moving around is the, is the toilet. <laughs> and the uh, methyl bromide fire extinguisher. We've got the um, access panel off the one of the bomb bays open here so you can actually see into the where the 100 pound anti-submarine bombs are stored. Um, they're quite a novel setup in that the, the bomb doors were just spring loaded. The bomb would release and the weight of it would hit the doors, spring them open, the bomb would fall away and the doors just spring back really quickly and uh, saves a lot of complications with having hydraulic jacks and things to open them as you'd need on any uh, bigger bigger aircraft. 
up here we've got the um, radio operator's parachute, remembering the gunner's ones down here underneath the gun turret door. There's also an emergency exit up in the roof. Uh, there's three emergency exits in the, each compartment. Um, so here we've got the wireless operator's uh, position, and he would often also double as the air gunner, um, as you know, if they became under attack. These old radios, have, you know, they were very early um, use of radios in the Royal Air Force aircraft. They hadn't sort of had much up until the early 1930s, and. You know, we've got these two great big units here. One's the receiver and one's the transmitter. They couldn't talk on them, it was all just Morse code on the Morse key here. And they also had a, what's called a crystal monitor here because the radios have to have these different crystals and, and coils put in them for each different frequency that they wanted to transmit or receive on. So it was pretty complicated, and a lot of it, as I say, was just listening for Morse and or listening for nulls for navigation, and you know, and, and the noise and um, heat of battle. It must have been extremely difficult to get much sense out of them. Over here on the right-hand side of the cabin is the electrical services panel. It was the radio operator's job to look after the electrical systems on the aircraft. There wasn't actually very many electrical systems on the early Ansons, apart from the radios and the fuel and flap gauges, that was about it. They didn't have any electric starters, so um, there wasn't a lot to look after. In the navigator station here, they carried a lot of, you know, specialised nav equipment and um, circular slide rules. This one is just for getting the right, well, what's a bombing computer to get the bombing angle computer. With your height and airspeed, just to know exactly when to drop your bomb. And he had his own little instrument panel here with airspeed, altitude, a stopwatch, and a clock, and another little observation compass. He had the chart table here, which you could sort of open out and make a bigger protractor here so he can um, mark his course off. So important that they kept track, you know, this aircraft were operating, you know, several hours out to sea, out of sight of land, so they really had to keep track of every turn and every sort of variation of wind that they came across to find their way home. And of course, a lot of aircraft, Coastal Command aircraft, were lost, not to enemy action, but to flying into hills, coming back to England and the terrible weather that they were forced to operate in. I was fortunate to find a lot of this equipment before internet trading really kicked off because since sort of uh, mid 2000s um, everything's gone up in price so much because of the because of the internet you were able to sort of buy stuff at reasonable prices I think if I had to buy it all again now it would cost me just about as much as it cost me for the whole aeroplane in the first place. Moving into the um, cockpit area now on uh, operations they wouldn't have had dual controls fitted because all the RAF bombers were obviously um, single pilot. Um, so this would be out and the pedals fold up out of the way so the bomb aimer can crawl up into the nose when they're approaching the target. Over on the right hand side of the cockpit here we've got all the bomb fusing um, switches and this is for the 100 pound bombs on the centre section and for the light carriers, you have eight bombs in the forward compartments and you select which ones you want to drop on this panel here. Here we have the fuel collar on and off. So here we've got the ring and bead sight for the pilot's 303 machine gun, which is mounted down here by his left knee. And he can cock the gun and clear jams from, from the cockpit here. Got the pressure gauge for the brakes clock obviously, the um, tachometer for the dual tachometer for the engine RPM, the pilot's blind flying panel here, the standard RAF six pack which all the aircraft had, PA compass and various engine instruments, fuel gauges, temperature gauges. So um, because of all the glass in these things they get terribly hot in the summer so they, they have this sun blind which you could sort of pull over the top, they'd probably have a folded back on operations because they'd obviously want to keep a lookout for any enemy aircraft, but uh, at least on the ground it sort of gives you some relief on a hot day. So we've we've tried to keep the cockpit or instrument panel as original as possible. Um, we have had to make some concessions to modern days with the transponder and radio, but we've managed to hide them out. Here we have the diagram of the fuel and um, oil system, which was always on the shelf, but we've made a little box there to, and we take that off when we're flying and here we have the modern radios and electrical panel, intercom, what have you, 
hidden away underneath. The same, same with the uh, with the fuel flow. We've got a the bomb aimer's steering um, indicator here. He would push the button up front to tell the pilot to turn left or right. But we've got that um, hiding on modern digital fuel flow indicator because the early fuel gauges weren't that accurate. 